How's it going and welcome to No Fun Lads Guide Series on Candlekey Mysteries, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be taking a look at the book, Book of the Raven. And we're going to be looking at all the fun things that pertain there, so players do not watch this, but DMs that want added insight, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover here. Our tale begins in Candlekeep with the book, Book of the Raven. This book was donated years ago, but interesting enough, it was found semi-recently and someone slipped something inside of this book, a map. And what is that map? It is going to lead your players to a chateau where they can meet with a coven of were ravens. For possible hooks to get your players to find this book, they could be searching for lore on the Vistani in their other planar travels, or they could look for possible routes into and out of the Shadowfell. But alternatively, this book can literally fall into your player's hands as a raven delivers the book directly to them. Once your players read this book, they'll discover that the author, whose name isn't given, traveled around with the Vistani for quite some time. And it's here where your players will be able to gleam a lot of information about the Vistani and also the author's travels. The interesting thing though is, at the end of the book, it ends with the author making their way up a mountain pass to a castle, and it, what it looks like is the person was stopped writing mid-sentence as the writing ends mid-sentence. So, so we can infer several things from that pertaining to another adventure in the 5e lineup, but your players may have a different idea. And why is that? That is because your players are going to be given this awesome map. Now look at this map, this thing is awesome. So your players read this thing and they can read of course that little legend at the bottom, and they can go ahead and follow the trail. Your players are going to have to figure out where this play starts, but realistically, if you're running this as a one-shot, you're probably not going to put too much emphasis on this. You're going to go ahead and say, okay, you can find the which way, and you're going to go this way, and then that way, and then eventually you're going to make your way to that location located to the west of the Scorch of the Red Worm. So if your players read that journal and it ends with the author making their way to a castle, then your players might look at that picture and think, oh, maybe that is the castle and we're going to be going to a castle. Not quite the case because that castle is probably something else, but your players are going to be arriving to a chateau. Now, of course, feel free to flesh out this travel as much as you desire, but if you want to get the game going, then go ahead and just expedite the thing. Now, where is this map taking us? This map is taking us to Chalet Brantifax, which was a noble estate that was owned by the Brantifax oh so long ago, However, the family has died off and is now currently being used by the group of were-ravens that call themselves the Scarlet Sash. Now the thing about this adventure is it's practically a three-parter. The first part is a Scooby-Doo-like adventure where your players are exploring around a haunted mansion, which is haunted but also doubles as the were-ravens trying to scare the players away. The second is an interaction with the were-ravens and trying to build a rapport with their society and eventually be brought into their society, the Scarlet Sash. And the third is your players crossing over into the Shadowfell and battling the undead. Now the Scarlet Sash members that are here, their purpose in life is to gather evil artifacts and hide them away from the unjust. So they are currently using the chalet to go ahead and hide away some things until they can find a better location to hide all these evil objects. Once your players actually walk around and stumble upon the were-ravens, they'll actually uncover that the were-ravens have in their possession right now an idol dedicated to Orcus, and they definitely don't want anybody to have that in their possession. So the first thing you have to decide here is, do your players arrive during the day, or do they arrive at night? As when your players arrive during the day, they can go ahead and explore around and all of the fun spooky stuff will happen. But if your players arrive at night, then they'll see lights emanating out from the location, specifically on the upper floors. That is going to tell them that people live here. I would strongly recommend that your players show up during the day, and that way your players will be exploring around this mansion, and the scary stuff will happen, and they don't know that it's a group of people in here, not until later on. So the important thing to discuss here is the Scarlet Sash, the Were-Raven group. They are not an evil group. So if anything goes down, they are going to run away. They don't want to deal with combat with anybody. They will just simply transform into Raven form and fly away. And it's here where we get some excellent information about every single member of the Scarlet Sash that is currently located here. We get their names, their personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws. That is so great. That allows you to work so many details into this adventure. And not only this adventure, but presumably for adventures later on. So to add to the scariness of this location, as your players explore around this chalet, in addition to all the scary stuff that they'll hear natively, 
you can also have the Were Ravens use their mimicry to go ahead and instill more fear into them. And this is going to totally prove if you have people that are scared to run away, then they run away. But if your players stick around, then the Were Ravens are eventually going to confront them. And also to front load this adventure here, we also have information about joining the Scarlet Sash. This is for some awesome later down the line content. Your players can build a rapport with all of these were ravens, and eventually they can be brought into the society. And this is a font of amazing adventures. Your players join a were raven group where they go out and seek out evil objects and keep them away from evil people. There's a whole campaign dedicated to that right there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into all of the locations here, and then we can get into how you can use the Scarlet Sash to get your players into the Shadowfell. But first, I just wanted to say, if you haven't already joined the Candlekeep Mysteries Discord or the Reddit, go ahead and join in. There are so many DMs, hundreds of other DMs, that are running these adventures alongside you, and they can give you some excellent information. I'm a part of them, and so many others are. So go ahead and join that Discord, links down below. For areas 1, 2, and 3, we have the cellar. As previously mentioned, this house has a story to tell. As your players explore around, they'll be able to uncover the clues of what happened here about the family that resided here and what exactly went down. So as your players explore around the cellar, you should go ahead and seep in that creepiness where they can hear the faint whisper on the wind. I can't get out! That is definitely going to startle them. If they start looking around, what was that? What was that? You know, that's pretty awesome. In Area 3, the Haunted Well, your players are going to be able to look down and see, you know, just a well that leads to water. But more importantly, from its depths, they're going to hear... Brown, where are you, boy? The reason for this haunting is because the Baron of this establishment was sleepwalking and fell down this well. The reason for the sleepwalking? He had a dog that he loved so much. Unfortunately, the dog died of old age, and during the night, he had fits of sleepwalking, and during the sleepwalking, he stumbled into the well and drowned. Should your players go down into the well, they won't find the ghost because the spirit is too weak to manifest. But, should your players spend a decent amount of time looking, they can in fact find a holy symbol of Sunni. This thing also contains a portrait of the Baron's wife. Your players aren't going to recognize this picture of the wife until they see the framed portrait in Area 17, however. But what is cool is if your players take that item and lay it to rest with the Baron in the graveyard in Area 9, then your players will have a charm of heroism bestowed upon them. In Area 4, we have the Cloak Room. This is presumably going to be the first room your players walk into, unless they bust a window or something. And when your players walk in, they'll be able to see a door that leads further into the house, but they also see a door, and that will lead down into the cellar. In Area 5, we have the Den. Your players look around here, and they'll be able to see that there was a portrait hung up on the wall. However, it has been moved. That is, of course, the portrait that is located in Area 17. And into this point, I would strongly recommend that as your players move to every single room, go ahead and just have some scary noise occur. Maybe it's when your players touch something that the mimicry happens, or your players move to the next room and then all of a sudden they hear a noise coming from some other room. Go ahead and play up into that Scooby-Doo factor because this is a one-shot and your players are going to buy into the fun. Or if you're not running this as a one-shot, you can go ahead and have this be slow, methodical, and creepy, but a blast to run. In Area 6, we have the Dining Room. This place doesn't see much use. And that is something that your players may be kind of looking around for. Has this place seen recent activity? They're not going to see recent activity until they make their way up to the second floor or they make their way over to the kitchen, Area 7. In Area 7, the kitchen, this is definitely where your players are going to notice that, oh, someone's been living here recently as there is food that is stored away in here and also there is dirty dishes waiting to be cleaned. Once again, building up that tension as they hear more noises coming from around the chalet then they're going to know that someone's here, but who is it or what is it? In Area 8, we have the parlor. As your players look around, they'll be able to see a harp, and you should go ahead and totally play up the creepiness of the harp. Maybe one of the were-ravens goes ahead and makes a little mimicry of the harp playing on its own, but when your players look, they don't see the strings being pulled. That could be a blast. When your players walked up to the chalet, they could go ahead and just immediately go to the graveyard, Area 9. And it's here where your players will be able to get a better understanding of what's going on here. Inside of this graveyard, your players will be able to see four graves. One for Baron Branifax, Brorn, Haluth, and Selphine. So hopefully you don't have a bunch of grave robbers in the party. But if you do, your players are going to uncover something very unfortunate. If your players go ahead and dig up Haluth's grave, then a scarecrow and two crawling claws are going to emerge as a hag stole the corpse long ago and replaced it just as a gag. 
So this is a fun little combat encounter, but once again, hopefully you don't have a bunch of grave robbers. In addition, if your players dig up Baron Brandifax, then they can go ahead and get a signet ring with 25 gold. The thing is, is if your players dig up Sylphine's grave, they theoretically could make a way to cross over into the Shadowfell. But if they don't know the exact ritual and how to do it, then it's probably not going to happen. And also, your players may be curious as to the relationship here because your players see that there's Baron Branifax, the father, and then they see a dog, and then they see Haluth and Sylphine. So Sylphine says, beloved daughter, and of course, Brorn says, hound of Branifax, but Haluth doesn't have anything. It says, our pride and joy lost too soon. So your players will probably be curious as to who that actually is. Up on the second floor, your players find areas 10 and 11, merely guest rooms, nothing too fancy about them. In area 12, we have the study. And it's here where if your players start looking around and find a journal, they can get some incredibly detailed information about what's going on here. They discover Baron Brantifax and the Baroness and all of the information pertaining here. A lot of great information to be gleamed here, and they'll begin to learn more and more about the chalet. And as your players read on, unfortunately they'll discover that Sylphine was born with deformities, and it appears as if her death might have had something to do with the Baroness. A lot of great information to be gleamed here as they go ahead and explore around more of this location, once again building up this location. I love world building without actually introducing anybody because it makes it feel real and lived in. And it has a sort of Dark Souls-esque world building to it. That's awesome. In area 13, we have the master bedroom. Your players look around and this, of course, used to be a master bedroom, but has long since been dilapidated. But your players can also find a secret door and that secret door will lead to area 14. So your players could stumble across the Raven meeting in area 14. In area 14, we have the Baron's Loft. So when your players walk in, they can discover that an explosion rocked this place oh so long ago. But more importantly, should you desire, the were-ravens are all right here, conversing amongst themselves about what to do with the Orcus figurine. So of course, this can go down a number of ways. One, you could go ahead and just say that the were-ravens are not here as they're currently flying around the place trying to avoid the PCs. Your players could sneak up on them and listen in on this conversation. Your players could go ahead and barge right in and see what's going on. Just go ahead and be prepared for whatever it is that you choose to have the adventure be. So I strongly recommend that you don't keep up the charade too long, especially if you are running a one-shot. You definitely want to get the ball rolling here. But if you are okay with having a longer time, multiple sessions, whatever the case may be, then you can go ahead and have the were-ravens duck out of here. But I definitely think that there is something to be said here. If your players are sneaking around, they could go ahead and listen in on the were-ravens discussing this. And that will be really cool because your players can overhear their good deeds of, Oh yes, we've got this evil figurine and we need to go ahead and stash it away from evil's eye. And your players are going to understand, okay, these people are good. Something I strongly recommend as well is these were-ravens aren't in a were-raven form. That they should look human. Because if they are human looking, then they can go ahead and have a grand reveal later on. And I think that is way cooler. Inside of this room, your players could also find a potion of mind reading. And the Scarlet Sash has no need for it, so your players can be given it for free. Pretty cool. In area 15, we have the Attic Nursery. Your players arrive here, and unfortunately, this place is haunted. The spirit of Sylphine manifests in the form of a poltergeist, who is going to go ahead and try and frighten away the PCs. There's actually nothing of true note to be found in here. Your players aren't going to be able to find too much. So if they run away, then it's no harm lost. But your players may think that there's something in here, in which case you can go ahead and continue to build on the story of this house and of the residents therein. In area 16, after your players go ahead and lift up that swollen door, then they can go ahead and make their way inside. And in here, they'll discover that this place has some goodies in it. There's a padlock trunk, which contains some hunting paraphernalia in the form of a heavy crossbow, some studded leather, and a whole bunch of hunting traps. Pretty cool. And also, if your players come here, then they can also discover some recent wardrobe additions, as the members of the Scarlet Sash use this location to go ahead and hang up their robes. And lastly, here in Area 17, we have the Storage Attic. Your players make their way inside of here, and they'll be able to see some beautiful paintings, and this will complete the story. Your players will be able to see what the Baron and Baroness looked like, and they can get some pretty cool portraits for, theoretically, some use later on. So in the text here, we're not given that much of a hook to go to the Shadowfell. So what I recommend is if you're running a one shot, then you have your players go to the chalet, explore around a bit, then eventually the Were Raven Society confronts them and says, hey, we're some good people, we're the Scarlet Sash, and if you want to join us, then you can go ahead and do a favor for us. We have a crossing to the Shadowfell, and beyond it, there is an item that was used by an evil person a saddle used by an evil horse master. 
If you get that saddle and bring it here, then you can go ahead and begin your steps to join the Scarlet Sash. Then your players go ahead and make their way over to the Shadowfell, and then they get into all the fun trappings there, and you can have a full rounded one shot. But that's only if you're running a one shot. More than likely, I'm seeing this as something that you add to a full blown campaign, in which case you can go ahead and spread that out over time. And you can go ahead and have the exploration be longer, and have the rapport and roleplay with the were-ravens take longer. And then eventually, over time, you then show off the crossing to the Shadowfell. But for the instances of this, I'm going to go ahead and approach it as a one-shot. So your players get told, hey, you can join the Scarlet Sash and become a were-raven if you do this good deed and take away that item from that evil guy. Let's go ahead and do it. Your players get shown down to the graveyard, and there inside, they dig up the grave, they lay down in it, and then they get transported to the Shadowfell. Once your players are over, they'll find themselves in a perpetual graveyard in which they'll find Harn Mausoleum. Your player's quest is to storm Harn Mausoleum, take the Saddle of the Cavalier, and bring it back to the real world. So to kick off this awesome epic combat, as your players approach Harn Mausoleum, two gargoyles are going to descend down and attack the party. Once your players defeat the two gargoyles, then 12 ghouls are going to go ahead and rampage toward them. And in addition to that, Drovath Harn is going to go ahead and make his way out of his own crypt and attack the party. This is a really dynamic encounter because it's multi-way process. Your players go up against two hard gargoyles, then they go up against a swarm of ghouls, and they go up against Drovath Harn, who has a ring of jumping. Harn is going to go ahead and make his way outside of the crypt, activate that ring of jumping, and jump right back up on the perch where the gargoyles once were, and he's going to go ahead and shoot down with his longbow. Now I'm going to tell you, this is an incredibly tough fight for a level 3 party. The two gargoyles, yeah, that's not as bad because the gargoyles don't hit that hard, but they do take a bunch of damage. If you don't have any magical damage, then they effectively have double the health. But of course, the real issue is the ghouls. Going up against 12 ghouls at once is a bad time. But what I think that a lot of smart players would do is go ahead and make their way into the mausoleum and use that choke point to their advantage where they only have to fight one ghoul at a time. Now something to note is this is the Shadowfell so you should go ahead and play up the spookiness to this location. Go ahead and tell them about all of the crazy sights and sounds that they're seeing and hearing and go ahead and make it feel like they're not in the real world. After dealing with all of the undead as your players make their way inside of the mausoleum, there they'll see the crypt in which Drovath Harn just appeared out of, and of course it is now empty. Something I strongly recommend is during that engagement, during that fight, you have Drovath Harn go ahead and talk to the party. More importantly, yelling at the party and saying, you're gonna die, this is my tomb but it will now be yours, things like that. Make the undead here feel personable. If you players search around a bit on a DC 13 perception check, your players will discover the hidden saddle of the Cavalier. If your players take it, then three Warhorse skeletons will emerge from the ground and attack. And that's also really cool. You go ahead and build up the fact, yes, Drovath Harn was a horse master in life and he is totally evil guy. And then your players go up against horses. That is pretty cool. So in the part of Back to the Material Plane, we get that... The were-ravens assume that the party is going to die, and thus they go ahead and refill the grave. And this is a total freak fest, as you can definitely have it where your players emerge back in the real world, but there they're covered in dirt, and they have to go ahead and claw their way out of the grave. Of course, if you've got people who have phobias of that, don't run it as that. Go ahead and just say that the grave's open or whatever. But once your players emerge from the graves and once again confront the Scarlet Sash, the Were-Ravens are going to be saying, Oh, that's awesome. You did that. How was the Shadowfell? Did you get the item? Da da da. This and that. And there ends the one shot. So one thing I'm going to go ahead and say before we get onto the Were-Ravens part is this is an incredibly tough encounter for a level three group. What I would say is if you have a TPK, you can't just go ahead and have it fade to black and your players fall through the Shadowfell and emerge back in the real world. And that's just something I recommend because of course this is a really tough encounter and you can always bring this Were-Raven group in at a later time. For the last portion of this book, we get information on the Were-Raven. So what's interesting is, is that they restatted the Were-Ravens. Normally Were-Ravens had a immunity to damage that wasn't silvered, much like all the other Lycanthropes. But these ones had a regeneration instead, which is pretty cool. And of course, we get this incredible art. I mean, come on. Ravens wearing red and black cokes. That just looks so incredibly awesome. 
And just like that, that is the adventure. So there's just so many ways you can work this into a full-blown campaign. This works excellent as a one-shot. It really depends on how you want to resolve things up, if you want to have your players join the Weraven Society, or if they just do this one good deed and go ahead and make their merry way. Whatever the case may be, this thing is awesome. You get the fun exploration of a haunted house. You get the role play of dealing with the potential ghost and the Weravens in this chalet. And you get the combat of an epic, awesome, undead horde. There is so much to work with here. This thing is awesome, and I absolutely recommend it for everybody because it can just work so incredibly well. So go ahead and tell me, do you plan on running this as a Scooby-Doo style adventure where your players are walking around and say, Jinkies, or is this going to be a super horror-fueled mystery? Are you going to have this be completely about the roleplay with the Were-Raven Society and dealing with the exploration of the house? And are you not even going to include the Shadowfell at all? Or are you going to flip that and have the Shadowfell be a bigger proponent of this adventure? Go ahead and tell me all those things because I want to know. But that is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.